Hi, my name is Cindy, and my family is very poor. No, actually, we're not poor. We're totally broke. So sometimes my lunch consists of a piece of stale bread and a glass of water. And our house is like a shabby barn, dangerous to live in. To be honest, even the neighbor's dog, Jack, wouldn't live in it, because only rich people live in our community. Even their dogs wear brand name clothes and eat nothing but delicacies that we, the poor, could never even dream of. And by the way, we would have been kicked out of the house a long time ago for not paying our bills if it wasn't for my grandma, my father's mother, helping us out with money. She was paying off our debts on the house, gave us money for some groceries. She bought notebooks and textbooks for me so I could finish school. Meanwhile, I wore horrible old clothes that was hard to look at because my grandmother didn't always have enough money to buy me new clothes. Why was our life like that? Well, we used to be very rich, and my parents used to buy me anything I wanted. My dad was a successful businessman. One day, he invested his and other people's money in a risky venture. It didn't work out, and in an instant, our lives changed. Gangsters in suits came in and took all our valuables. Dad's accounts were seized. He got terribly depressed and rarely left his room. And my mom just didn't care. She never worked and wasn't going to start. Mom would hang out with her many girlfriends, borrowing their clothes and talking to them all day long. And I hardly ever saw her. In fact, I was left on my own because my parents didn't care about me or my problems. But that's just the beginning of my story because I decided to change things to make my family rich again and become no different from the rest of our neighbors. Do you think I succeeded? Like my video, subscribe to the channel, and get comfortable. How do you think the poor differ from the rich? Well, of course, my arrogant rich neighbor Jim obviously thinks he has blue blood running through his veins. He was born with a gold spoon in his mouth, so he's entitled to a hot car, a hot girlfriend, and a pair of sneakers worth a few thousand bucks. I would like to tell him where he should shove that golden spoon. But my grandmother would have washed my tongue with soap for saying that. So, back to my question. The only thing that separates the poor from the rich is the amount of money. So, in order for my family to be rich again, I had to earn as much as I possibly could. Of course, I could come up with my own startup and become a millionaire within a few hours. However, I was never really good with computers. But I definitely could clean and cook, deliver mail, be a waitress at a cafe. I can do a lot of things. For example, I can smile beautifully. So, I easily got a job in a cafe. And then some rich neighbors offered me a job. They needed someone to come in and help them with their chores. I also handed out flyers on the street and delivered mail. And in order to achieve my dream sooner, I wrote custom texts, helped students with their homework, and a few other little side jobs. All in all, I got as many as eight jobs. And I was so happy that I was moving towards my dream. Truth be told, I was very tired. And sometimes even fell asleep in class. Imagine, I had to present my project in front of the class. I went to the blackboard, stood behind the pulpit, leaned on it, <laughs> and then I was woken up by my teacher and the laughter of my classmates. My rich neighbor Jim laughed the loudest, damn it. <sighs> the teacher was terrified because it was the first time I'd fallen asleep in class. She asked me to stay after class and told me everything she thought about it. Cindy, you should focus on your studies, not on money. I understand that your family is going through a hard time, but think about your future. Besides, your grandmother cares about your grades. I haven't told her yet that you're always falling asleep in class, but I can't hide it forever. Promise me you'll get more rest. I nodded back and silently walked out of the classroom. I will keep on working and keep pursuing my goal no matter what. After all, yesterday I received my first salary and the amount was quite impressive. I was thrilled with the money. I figured if I worked like this for two years, we could afford a car, fix up the house, and eat something tastier than stale bread. But I had to do something about the fatigue. So I gave myself a little more time to sleep and started taking a tasty lunch with me to school. 
My classmates, of course, noticed the change. I had never eaten in school before. But instead of being happy for me, they started making fun of me. Guess who was the biggest bully? Jim walked over to the table where I was eating my lunch and brazenly declared, Hey, beggar, where'd you get the money for your food? You probably stole it, didn't you? I boiled with anger, but remained silent. I pretended not to notice Jim. He didn't like that. The guy threw a sandwich at me and went back to his friends. They laughed like idiots, and I just cried and ran away. I rushed into the bathroom and ran into Sarah, a girl who lost her parents a few years ago and lived with her grandmother. She was holding a mop and a bucket. When she saw me, she lowered her eyes and tried to walk around me. I remembered that she works part-time as a janitor at our school, which means she too endures the mockery from the rich kids. I stopped her and suggested we take a walk together after class. I had half an hour before my shift started at the cafe, but Sarah unexpectedly declined. I'm sorry, but I don't have time after school. I was surprised that she doesn't want to be friends with me because we're poor, we have common problems. But Sarah shook her head. No, Cindy, you and I are totally different. You want to be rich, and you hate those who are above you in status. I may be poor, but I don't see what's wrong with that. Poverty is not a disease. I tried to change her mind, but Sarah walked out of the bathroom, letting me know that this conversation was over. Sarah was so wrong. Being poor is horrible. It's unbearable. And I'll prove it. I will not give myself any extra time for sleep. I'm going to keep working at the same pace. And with my paycheck, I'll buy myself some cool clothes and surprise everyone. Let Sarah see what some brand name clothes could do. I needed to set aside time for shopping right away. In between jobs, I popped into a boutique. The salespeople weren't too happy to see me, but they helped me find an incredibly beautiful dress and a pair of fancy shoes. After grabbing my purchases, I came home in a good mood. My mother met me at the door. She stopped me and looked suspiciously at the packages with brand logos. She took the bags and dumped the clothes on the table. What are these? She asked. My clothes. I bought it with my money. Where do you work? You have to study. Mom was clearly not happy. If you drop out of school, your grandmother will stop giving us money. It may be pennies, but we have to live somewhere and eat something. Return the clothes immediately. Let that old hag see how awful our lives are. Maybe then she'll give us more. Mom, where does Grandma get the money, I wondered. She is already helping us as much as she can. Mom laughed wryly. <laughs> your precious grandmother is a really rich woman, but she thinks that your father has to earn his own money and provide for his family. But he is good for nothing. I married a rich man. I don't want to live in poverty. As soon as your grandmother dies, we'll move into her fancy house and get all of her money. Having said that, Mom slammed the door and went off to see her girlfriends again. Dad, who was sleeping upstairs, now started ranting that we were keeping him awake. Before, I would have yelled back at my father. But right now, I was in shock. Is my grandmother rich? And we have to live in poverty? I was confused, not knowing how to feel about it. But I had no time to think about it. It was time to go to work. I cleaned my neighbor's house, then I ran to the cafe where I worked as a waitress. <laughs> it was all a blur. I took the tray with my order and carried it towards a noisy group of guys who didn't even bother to move over so I could set the food on the table. And when I was reaching over the table with the plate, one of the guys pushed me, and I dropped both the plate and the tray. The coffee poured over the guy's expensive phones, and the plate of spaghetti fell on one of the guy's pants. He jumped up and started yelling that I was an incompetent idiot, and that's when I recognized the guy. It was Jim. He pointed at the ruined iPhones and said, You owe us a lot of money now, slob. I'll give you one week, or I'll have you thrown out of your job like a homeless mutt and you'll never work again. I cried. Where could I get that kind of money? I thought of my grandmother, but I brushed aside the idea of asking her for money. What the hell? It was my grandmother's fault that the boys were making fun of me. She watches us live in poverty. I'd rather think of something on my own than go to her. I spent the whole next day at school with these thoughts in my mind, and after class, I got stopped by creepy Jim. He sat down right on top of my books and said, So, little beggar, have you figured out where you're going to get the money yet? Time's running out. He broke my pencil and pushed my bag off the table before he left the classroom. I felt so helpless that I cried out loud. 
Suddenly, my teacher came into the classroom, followed by my grandmother. I was so angry that I didn't even think about what had brought her here. I'm so sorry, Cindy, she said. Now I know how hard this must be for you. It turned out that my grandmother was contacted by the teachers. They told her how I was struggling with my work and asked her to help me. Why is she so calm about our situation? It turns out that it was my grandmother who gave my father the money to live on, and he didn't appreciate it and was just enjoying life. One day, my grandmother decided to teach my parents a lesson and reduced the payments. Our family quickly went bankrupt. My grandmother hoped my father would get a job, but he was acting all resentful, thinking that my mother should help him. My grandmother didn't even hope my mother would help, but she was surprised with my behavior. I'm so proud of you, granddaughter. You weren't afraid to get a job, and I decided it was time for you to be who you rightfully are. You are moving in with me, so you don't have to work, and you can finish your education in peace. I was so glad that Grandma, like a kind fairy, showed up and solved all my problems. But before, I would become an arrogant rich girl. Now I was a different person. I gave the money back to Jim, who was very unhappy with the turnaround, but he didn't say anything. I kept my part-time job at the coffee shop and became friends with Sarah, who was a nice girl. Now that I have changed, we easily found common ground. My dad suddenly found a job too. Things were finally getting better. Guys, what do you think? Does money make a person bad or good? Write your opinion in the comments. Like the video and click the red bell button to subscribe. Bell button to subscribe. Bell in algebra class, I purposely sat at the back of the classroom, right behind Brandon. The teacher was explaining the boring theorem of Pythagoras, so the class sank into a half slumber. It was a perfect moment to get another relic. While everyone was looking at the board with sleepy faces, I made a slight, almost jewel-like movement. I cut a strand of hair from Brandon's head with scissors. I was usually really good at it, so he didn't notice before, but this time it didn't turn out so cleverly. I brushed my hand against Brandon's neck lightly. The guy turned around and looked at me questioningly. I whispered, you've got a fluffer there. Brandon smiled and said with his sweet lips, thank you. Only eight letters and I'm already in heaven. When he stared at the board again, I put the hair in a cellophane bag and put it in my backpack. This specimen is especially valuable. Hi, I'm Mindy, and I'm going to tell you the story of my obsession with Brandon. This secret love goes all the way back to childhood, when he and I were still in the same kindergarten class. One day, I was hurt, and I cried. Then Brandon made such a funny face that I forgot all about the offense and started laughing. Already at that moment, I was hopelessly in love with him. Throughout junior and high school, Brandon was still my one and only. I knew everything about him. For example, that he likes a tuna sandwich, that he had the mumps as a child, and that he has a little sister that he's always fighting with. It was all in my journal. I called it Brandon Newell's Encyclopedia. From his first steps to the present. It may seem a little strange, or maybe not even a little, but then I was thinking that it couldn't be otherwise. Doesn't every girl have a book detailing the boy she secretly likes? The apothesis of my love was an altar in Brandon's honor. It was in my closet. I didn't tell anyone about it. It consisted of a small, about a meter tall, clay replica of Brandon, and things were arranged in a semicircle next to it, which I once stole from him. For example, the baseball cap he forgot on the bench during practice. I was there to take advantage of his absent-mindedness. I was not a kleptomaniac, and I didn't steal everything. Just Brandon's stuff. That's different. Then, my love justified all the bad things I did. A special place in Brandon's encyclopedia was given to all the girlfriends he had ever met. Oh, how many of them there were. And I hated everyone with a fierce hatred. They didn't do anything to me personally, but the mere fact that they were dating Brandon was enough to wish them all the wrong things. That Carrie, I mean, she was crazy. She was always throwing tantrums in front of everyone. I wanted to go over and slap her in the face. I didn't understand how she could be so bad to Brandon. I mean, he was perfect. Or Lila, she was such a pain in the ass. She made me want to fall into a lethargic sleep. 
or Veronica. All she talked about was her rich parents and her new jacuzzi. I'll admit Brandon did have one drawback, his taste in girls, because they all looked nothing like me. When he finally broke up with Betty, his latest fling, I was so happy. The time had come when he would ask me out on a date. Why did I think that? I accidentally dropped my textbooks, and Brandon came over and picked them up. Our hands touched. Uh, he was totally into me. I could feel it. I just had to wait for him to tell me. I checked social media almost every second to see if Brandon had texted me. But so far, he hadn't said anything. I guess he was gathering his courage. One day, I accidentally discovered that he was getting regular likes from someone named Maggie. Maggie? What a terrible name! She also happens to be in his friend list. Who is she? I went through her profile. I came to the conclusion that she was the most ordinary and uninteresting person in the world. A member of the chess club, editor of the school newspaper. Ugh, such a bore. I hope Brandon doesn't fall for this person. I had to stalk him right away, which wasn't new to me. I knew by heart where he was every day of the week, what time he came back from practice, when he and Jack and Tom hung out at the coffee shop. I was a real master stalker. No one's ever been able to track me down. So there you go. I waited in the bushes for Brandon to come out of the stadium. And then, like a professional ninja, I hid in the shadows and followed him all the way to the park. Brandon sat down on the bench, and he seemed to be waiting for someone. And then she appeared. I knew right away who it was. Maggie! I shouted out, unable to control my emotions. Brandon turned around at the noise, but I hid in time. Maybe she was just helping him get his grades up, but my hopes were dashed when Maggie walked right up to Brandon and they kissed. The binoculars that had been in my hands the whole time fell to the ground. It should have been me in her place, said my obsessive inner voice. I was overwhelmed with hatred. I wanted, like Godzilla, to destroy cities. Adding to the tragedy of the situation, it rained heavily. Brandon and Maggie covered their heads with their jackets and ran off into the distance. I stood there like a wet chicken, unable to believe what I was seeing. I came home, soaked to the skin. My mother looked at me with horror and asked, Baby, what happened? Are you okay? I held out a dramatic pause and said, No, my heart is shattered. After these words, I went up to my room and fell like a stone on my bed. I spent the whole week at home with a fever. At night, I had nightmares. Brandon and Maggie's faces peeking out of the darkness, laughing at me. But the sickness receded. I came back to life with renewed vigor and with one idea that never left my mind. I should kidnap Brandon. The audacity of the plan made my legs buckle for a second. Why didn't I think of this before? What a great plan! Better yet, over my head, like a huge banner, appeared the neon letters. This is a terrible idea. I'm like a giant of thoughts. I've calculated in my head the perfect moment when I could sneak Brandon out. After practice, when he walks through the park, it's obvious. My inner evil genius rejoiced. On X day, I borrowed my parents' car without asking and waited for Brandon at the right place. There wasn't a soul around. The guy showed up and walked past me. I jumped out from behind the bushes, crept up behind him, and held a rag soaked in chloroform to his nose. That was it. Brandon was sleeping like a baby. First, I had a hard time getting him into the car, then into the basement, trying not to make too much noise. I tied him to a pipe and sat on the opposite side, waiting for Brandon to wake up. No one looked in the basement. My parents were so busy working that they walked around the house like zombies, not paying attention to anything. Brandon finally woke up and stared at me, uncomprehending. <gasps> Where am I? He asked confusedly. You're at my house, I answered. Mindy? I held a glass of water to his lips. Brandon took a few sips. What happened? I was walking and then I passed out. I'm still dizzy. He looked around, tried to get up, but found himself firmly tied up. What the hell is that? Somewhere upstairs in the street, thunder rumbled. The chandelier flashed. I laughed like a mad scientist. <laughs> now you're mine. And Brandon squealed like a girl in a cheap horror movie. I don't know if I realized at that moment that I looked like a maniac. I thought it was very romantic. Brandon and I were finally together, and no Maggie would come between us. That's how Brandon came to live in my basement. 
The next day, the police questioned the students, but to no avail. I ran home after class, elated, knowing that my lover was waiting for me. After a couple of days, Brandon said he was bored and couldn't stay down all the time. I borrowed a game console from my little brother while he was at scout camp. Oh, just what I needed. Brandon was excited when I brought the game console to the basement, and a soda, and I went to the store and got everything he asked for. Going down to the basement again, I thought it was the perfect time to declare my love. Brandon, you know I care about you, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And what's more, I've loved you since I was a little girl. And you, do you love me too? I just got teary-eyed. Oh, shit. Brandon swore and threw the joystick on the floor. (sighs) Difficult level. Never could get past it. Listen, we're out of gummies. Can you run over and get some more? I was stunned and didn't know what to say. While I was confessing my love to him, he was eating chips and playing soccer. So, you don't like me? I asked the guy as I watched him dig out the rest of the chips from under his fingernails. I'm sorry, Mindy, but you're not my type. On stiff legs, I climbed upstairs, ready to scream in pain. Was this all a self-delusion? I tried to mentally go back to that moment when Brandon was helping me pick up my books the way he smiled at me. Maybe he just helped me out of politeness. I was faced with a brutal reality. It was like hitting a wall at 200 kilometers per hour. Brandon doesn't like me. The next day, his picture appeared on milk cartons. I took one of them, threw it on the pavement as I left the store, and then crushed it with my foot. It was as if years of love had leaked out of the bag along with the milk and evaporated into the sun, leaving a stain. Maybe I never really loved Brandon. Maybe I was just lonely. I cried on the street. People passing by looked sympathetically at me in the crushed bag. What was I supposed around him? And what did I get? Just a broken heart and a shattered world of illusions. I opened the closet and stomped on the altar with my foot, gathered all the things of my former crush and threw them in the trash. And I solemnly burned the encyclopedia in the patio, deciding that I'd had enough of being madly in love. No more kidnapping, no more stalking. I'd rather have a cute puppy. What would you do if the love of your life was unrequited? Write your answers in the comments. Like the video and share it with your friends. And share it with your friends. Hello everyone, I am Matt. I'm a college student and in my free time, I used to work on my automobile startup. Everything was good in my life. My grades, my friends, my family. Only one thing was missing, love. For as long as I could remember, I had been single and never had a girlfriend. But this changed on the first day after our summer break. I was playing basketball in college. My teammate gave me a pass, but it was too high. While trying to catch it, I lost balance and fell on a girl in the audience. She looked so beautiful. Her eyes, her hair, her lips, and everything was perfect. Hey, uh, sorry. I hope I didn't hurt you, I said. No, not at all. I'm glad you fell on me and didn't hurt yourself by falling on the floor, she replied. I would have asked her out on a date at that very moment. But my teammate shouted at me and said, Hey, man, please come back to the court if you're done chatting. The girl giggled, and with a smile on my face, I went back to playing. Knowing that she was watching gave me a lot of enthusiasm. I scored about 20 baskets in a flash and made my team win the match. The next day, we met in the college playground. Her name was Katie, and she was studying economics. Our interests were very similar. We would meet around lunch every day and talk for hours. Soon, I was in love with this beautiful girl. Katie encouraged me to give more time to my startup. Every day, she would check how many investors I had called and whether I had received funding or not. I called about a hundred investors every day, but because of the pandemic, no one was interested in making new investments. When I told this to Katie, she told me I was making excuses and should work harder. I started spending sleepless nights working, but sadly had no luck. One day, Katie made a reservation for us in a seven-star restaurant without telling me. I told her my startup still hadn't received funding and I couldn't afford that. Suddenly, she got angry at me. It's a guy's job to take a girl to luxurious places. You aren't a man if you can't do this. That really hurt me. But I didn't want to further escalate the fight, so I kept quiet. 
After eating at a normal restaurant, he went to her place on her insistence. I tried to cheer her up, but no use. In the middle of the night, I heard something, and it woke me up. I noticed Katie wasn't in her bed. I went to the other room to check on her. What I saw shocked me. She was streaming herself online and talking to an old man. When I asked her who this man is, she said, Might be my new boyfriend. But, oh, I forgot to tell you. We're done seeing each other. It's over. After this, she started talking to that old man again who looked like a Russian billionaire. I asked her, Why are you doing this to me? If there's an issue, I'm sure we can talk and work it out. She replied, It's not possible. I only date rich guys. I wish I had known your financial status earlier. Would have saved time. I never knew Katie was such a shallow person. This came as a complete shocker to me. Heartbroken, I decided to leave from her place. I got really depressed. Katie was the first person I had fallen in love with, and she broke my heart. From that day on, I started working day and night on my startup, so I don't think about her. I sent letters to multiple venture capitalists so I could get funding. I even put out a job opening so I could expand my team and increase the output. One day, while I was working in a co-working space, a girl came to my table and said, Hey, I saw your job opening online and decided to come straight to your office and meet. Is the vacancy still open? I said, Sure. Do you have your resume? I went through her CV and it turned out she was really talented. She didn't seem too worried about her salary, so I decided to hire her that very moment. We started working together and hit it off really well. Her name was Mia, and she was a college student herself. With her help, my startup and personal life both started getting better. We both enjoyed working alone with each other till late hours of the night. There was only one problem though. I still hadn't got any funding. I was running out of money. I figured that there was only one option to keep the company running. I'll have to lay off Mia. This was a very tough decision for me as I had actually started liking her. But every time I would try to confess, I would be reminded of Katie and stop myself. One morning, as I was preparing how to give her the bad news, she came to my table and said, Hey, I had written to a few investors for funding myself. Luckily, one did reply and has agreed to give some money. She showed me the letter and it made me so happy. Although it was a very small amount, it was enough for us and I didn't need to fire her. It happened quite a few times. Somehow... Mia was able to arrange small amounts of money at just the right time to keep the company running. I was so glad that I hired her. One morning, Mia called me and told me that she was under the weather and couldn't make it to the office. I wished her to get well soon and carried on with my work. At around midday, though, I was paid a visit by someone I never expected to meet again. It was Katie. She had a big suitcase in her hand. I asked, Hey, what are you doing here? She told me, I wanted to see you, Matt. What I had done was wrong, and that's why I wanted to apologize. I told her that I have moved on and it was all right. But then she said, I still haven't moved on, Matt. I still love you. And to prove my love, I have brought with me one million dollars in this suitcase. I told that Russian man about you, and he has agreed to give you this funding. I was shocked. I never expected my dream would be fulfilled in such a manner. Then Katie continued. I have only one condition. If you want this money, you'll have to fire Mia. I've seen your Insta stories with that girl, and you being around her makes me very jealous. Her condition left me speechless. I had to make a decision at that very moment. On one side was my startup. I had worked really hard on it, and funding of $1 million could give my business a huge boost. And on the other side was Mia, a girl who had stood by me through thick and thin, a girl who had worked with me day and night, like this was her own startup. That's when it hit me. I couldn't let go of Mia. I was in love with her, I told Katie. 
thanks for your help. But unfortunately, I'll have to reject your offer. After saying this, I ran from there. I had to tell Mia about my feelings. I left the office building. But as I was running towards the taxi, I bumped into Mia. She was standing with an old man outside the office. I asked, What are you doing here? Aren't you unwell? And who is he? The old man started giggling. He said, <laughs> Don't be shocked. I'm her father, young man. Mia had told me she is in love with you. But men have used her for her money so many times that I wanted to check myself if you're trustworthy. You see, I'm an oil billionaire. And I was the one who was giving Mia the money for your startup. I wanted to be sure you were loyal to her. That's why you sent Katie to me with cash. He laughed. Exactly. <laughs> there was a camera attached to her shirt. I'm so glad you rejected the money and passed the test, young man. Mia stood there and smiled. I went close to her and hugged her. I said, Your money is not important, Mia. I love you for the person you are. She was really touched. She kissed me immediately. Also, you can keep that bag of money, young man, her father said. Your company is potential, and I am eager to be a part of your success. My dreams had finally come true. I was in a relationship with the love of my life, and now my startup was taking off too. Taking off? I had red roses in my hand, a beautiful ring in my pocket. Today, I was going to propose to the love of my life. I took a deep breath and pressed the bell of her house. But when the door opened, I was left speechless. A muscular man came outside. In his arms was my girlfriend, Janice. She said, Hey, what are you doing here? I said, I thought we had a date today. Who is this man, by the way? She replied, I totally forgot to introduce you. This man is Charlie, my new boyfriend. I couldn't believe this was happening to me. The girl who I was planning to get married to had found a new boyfriend. I was almost in tears. I asked, Why are you doing this to me, Janice? What am I doing to you? You were the one who made me false promises. You said that you'll have your own house this year, but I don't need to remind you that you still live in your parents' basement, Bill. You're still a child stuck in a man's body. Her comments really hurt me. But I tried to logically argue with her. You know, a job in the police doesn't pay that well. I could have done a normal corporate job, but it's very important for me to help make this world a better place. I beg you to give me some more time. I'll get a promotion soon, and we'll be able to afford a new house. She replied, I don't have more time to give you, Bill. I need to be with a man. Sadly, you aren't one. After saying this, she shut the door on my face. I left from there, heartbroken. Every time you leave a unique title idea in the comment section, you get a chance to see it animated! Hello everyone, my name is Bill. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. The next day, I woke up and somehow found the courage to go to work. As soon as I reached, uh, my boss called me to his cabin. A beautiful blue-eyed girl with red hair was standing next to him. My boss said, Hi, Bill. I'm pleased to introduce you to Anna. She is a new recruit in our department, and you will be responsible for teaching her how things work. I had no interest in talking to anyone in the office. I wanted to stay away from everyone, especially girls. But I couldn't tell this to my boss. So I unwillingly agreed to do what he said. Anna was a really enthusiastic recruit. She had questions and opinions about everything that happened in the department. She was especially interested in old robbery cases. I neither had the time nor the patience to entertain her. I would always give her short and cold replies, but that didn't stop her from talking to me. Once, when I gave her a car theft case to work on, she came to me angrily and said, Police should work on bigger things. There's too much injustice in this world. The distress in her eyes worried me. I realized that she shouldn't be left alone and hence brought her on a case I was working on myself. This is the point things actually started changing between us. 
We would both stay in the office late at night and work for hours. I realized Anna is a lot like me. One day, during lunch break, she told me, My parents had been shot by the Mafia when I was young. From that onwards, I decided I'll bring them down and make this world a better place. I really related to her passion and started developing feelings for her. Little did I know, she was hiding a huge secret. One night, when I was working alone in the office around midnight, I decided to see what old cases Hannah had been reading about. I went to her desk and started looking through the files. There were multiple documents related to the 2019 New York robbery. I opened the files and saw the pictures of the suspects. That's when I came across the picture of a girl there. It was none other than my trainee, the girl I had started liking, Anna. I had to tell this to my boss. Anna was a criminal. I rushed to grab my phone. That's when I felt a knife behind my back. Anna was holding it. I didn't know she was in the office. She said, If you move an inch, I'll be forced to use this knife and get rid of you. I said, I'm not afraid. You are a liar, Anna, and I won't stop until I put you behind the bars. She replied, You don't know my reasons. These are the mafia that got rid of my whole family. I stole from them because I wanted to bankrupt them and bring all of them down. I said, That still doesn't justify your crime, Anna. Now, I understand why you joined the police. You wanted to destroy all the evidence related to you. What else could I have done, she replied. I stole millions of dollars from these criminals and gave all the money to charity. But instead of rewarding me, the police are after my life. Suddenly, tears started trickling down her eyes. She threw away the knife. I don't want to hurt you, Bill, but I request you not to tell anyone that I was the one behind these robberies. I only did all this to make the world a better place. The police weren't going after these people, so I decided to do it on my own. I cut her monologue short and put handcuffs on her hands. You are under arrest, Anna. I can sympathize with you, but can't forgive you. The next day, Anna was put behind the bars, and my boss rewarded me for finding the truth about her. This gave me a lot of motivation. I decided to go after the Mafia now. I wanted to prove to Anna and myself that they can be brought down legally. I had only started gathering evidence against them when my boss called me to his cabin. He said, Bill, why aren't you working on the pickpocketing case? I said, I told you before, I'm working on bigger crimes committed by the Mafia. I want to see them all behind the bars. He replied, Please don't do that. These people are my friends. They give so much funding to the police department, you can't even imagine. But I want to catch them, sir. I want to make this whole world a better place, I said. My order is final, Bill. If you go after these people, you'll be fired. I left his cabin dejectedly. I started wondering if Anna was actually right. But how could she have been? One crime doesn't justify another. That night, when I was out drinking alone, I received a call from my mother. Bill, there are some men at our place. They are threatening to hang your father. Please reach home fast. I got really worried and rushed to home. I couldn't believe it when I saw the mafia sitting inside my living room. They had actually tied a noose around my father's neck. What are you doing? I shouted. Their leader came close to me and said, This time, we have only tied the noose. We wanted to warn you. Next time... We'll actually get rid of him if you don't stop investigating our cases, officer. After saying this, all of them left from our house. That night, I couldn't sleep and kept twisting and turning in my bed. Everything was clear to me. I realized why Anna chose to bring down the Mafia illegally. She was actually doing the right thing. I felt guilty for arresting her. The next day, I entered the office before everyone else and opened files related to Anna's arrest. I took out important evidence from there and burned all of it. Everyone was shocked how the evidence disappeared. Luckily, no one doubted me. Soon, because lawyers couldn't build a case against Anna, she was released from prison. I went to receive her. I'm sorry for all the trouble I put you through, Anna. Please forgive me, I said. It's all right, Bill. You were only doing your job. I'm pretty sure you are the reason evidence against me suddenly disappeared, so thanks a lot for that. I smiled and then said, I have seen with my own eyes, Anna. Police don't go after the Mafia. That's why I have decided to take your path now. I want to be your partner in crime and bringing down the Mafia. Will you please hire me? She giggled and nodded. Sure. Let's together make this world a better place. She said this and hugged me tightly. From that day on, we became a team. I dropped all the cases against Mafia so my boss wouldn't suspect I was working against them. At night, I would help Anna in bringing down the Mafia. And in the morning, I would work in the police department to destroy the evidence against both of us. This is how I became a police officer in the day and a cunning criminal in the night. I fell right into the water, and the waves immediately carried me away from the yacht. 
I panicked. I was a very bad swimmer. All sorts of horror stories about sharks immediately came to my mind. Help! Hey, wait! I'm here! No one heard me. The yacht was sailing further and further away, taking my chances of salvation with it. I had swallowed a lot of seawater, and tears were streaming down my face. It was the end. All of a sudden, someone grabbed my arm. Thinking it was a shark, I screamed and turned around. Hi, my name is Lana. I never went to parties and was always reading books. I was a nerd in college, and I was absolutely obsessed with comics. At first, I just liked reading them, and then I started coming up with and illustrating my own stories. I was massively inspired by Dan Evans, a famous comic artist, and I dreamed of becoming as cool as he was. One day, I was walking through college hallways and reading comics as usual. I turned the corner and suddenly bumped into someone. My book fell out of my hands. I looked up and froze. Damn it! It was Blake, the coolest guy in college, and my crush. Our classmates surrounded us, and someone noticed that my comic had fallen to the floor. They immediately started laughing at me. I wanted to sink through the floor with humiliation. I stared at Blake in horror and was silent. Hey, look at that. Blake's so handsome, he left our nerd speechless. Blake laughed. I'm not interested in such quiet and plain girls. That hurt me, and I ran away so I wouldn't burst out crying right in front of everyone. Wandering around the city, I decided I wanted to change, become bold and interesting. I walked into a cafe, sat down at a far table, and started drawing on my tablet. It had always helped me calm down. Then, I suddenly heard someone behind me say, This looks amazing. I turned around and saw a guy with piercings and a bunch of tattoos. He sat down at my table, and we got to talking. The guy's name turned out to be Henry, and he was a master at a tattoo parlor that liked drawing too. I looked at his tattoos and had an idea. What if I got a tattoo too? When I told Henry about my thought, he supported me and brought me to his tattoo parlor. We made a sketch together, and I came home with a tattoo on my neck. It looked very unusual and super cool. I decided that I wouldn't tell anyone about it just yet. The next day, I wore a jumper with a high collar to college. During a lecture, we were suddenly told that a week-long trip to Florida would be organized for the best of students. They read out the list of those who would go, and I heard my name. I always wore oversized clothes, though, and I heard everyone start making fun of me. I bet she'll even wear a hoodie to the beach. I gritted my teeth with anger. I was so tired of those bullies, and I decided that one tattoo wasn't enough for me. They thought I was a shy nerd. I would show them all. After college, I went back to the tattoo parlor and told Henry I wanted to get more tattoos. He tried to dissuade me. You should think it over and not do it when you're so emotional. Get temporary tattoos for now, okay? Live with them for a while, and if you don't change your mind, we'll make them permanent. I thought about it and agreed. I drew all the new sketches myself. A few days later, Henry transferred them to my skin right before the trip. I felt like a completely different person. In Florida, our group checked into a hotel. I ended up in a room with Miley, my best friend. No one found her impressive either, which was probably why we'd become friends. I hadn't even told Miley about my tattoos yet. I had to lie and say that I wasn't feeling well so she would go to the beach without me. About a half hour later, I plucked up my courage and I changed into a bikini. I let my hair down and put on a cap and dark glasses. Then I went to the beach and slowly walked along the shore. Blake suddenly noticed me. He immediately started complimenting my figure and my tattoos. Just imagine, he hadn't recognized me. I slowly took off my glasses and smiled coquettishly at him. To say that Blake was stunned would be an understatement. Well, who's speechless now? Everyone was shocked by my transformation. They crowded around me and looked at me like I was a museum exhibit. Everyone really liked my tattoos. And only the prettiest girl in college called them tasteless. Nora, just admit that you're jealous. Lana turned out to have a very cool figure, and her tattoos are pretty great too. Nora turned green with anger, and <laughs> I was over the moon. While we were hanging out on the beach, Blake was doing everything he could to please me. He brought me cocktails, adjusted my sunbed, and put sunscreen on my shoulders. The seawater could quickly wash away my temporary tattoos. 
so I had to sit in the sun. When we got back to the hotel, Miley came up to me, upset. Why didn't you tell me about your tattoos? I thought we were friends. I had to admit that only one of my tattoos was real, just so I could calm my friend down. One day, we were walking to the beach and saw an announcement about an upcoming palm tree party. The queen of the beach would be chosen there. Of course, all the girls immediately wanted to participate. Lana, let's go to the party together. Hmm? Had I heard right? Of course, I wanted to and I immediately agreed. However, when I was returning to the hotel, Nora suddenly blocked my way. She forcefully grabbed my shoulder and hissed, stay away from Blake. I looked at her defiantly. Or what? Or you'll regret it. It's pointless to threaten me. Blake likes me, so deal with it. I walked by the shocked Nora into the hotel. The same day, Miley and I went shopping. I was hoping to find a beautiful but not very expensive dress. We were exhausted by the time I finally got lucky. I would have never worn such a dress before, but that day, I liked it, surprising even myself. Back in our room, I hung it up on the back of a chair and went to bed, looking forward to the next night. Everyone would be stunned after seeing me. But in the morning, I was in for an unpleasant surprise. When I got out of bed, I saw something terrible. My dress had been cut up. I was shocked. It didn't take me long to guess who had done it. Of course, it must have been Nora. Ugh, she was so nasty. But she wasn't going to get rid of me that easy. I went down to the reception and asked Ooh. for sewing supplies. While everyone was out hanging on the beach, I drew a sketch of a new outfit and started to work on the dress. I was able to turn it into an original Hawaiian-style top and skirt. To be honest, I liked my new outfit even more than I'd liked the dress. Remember how I'd said that everyone had been shocked to see me with tattoos and in a bikini? Well, my appearance at the party had the same effect. Blake met me at the entrance to the beach, and when we appeared on the dance floor together, mmm, that was something. You should have seen our classmates' faces. Nora, once again, turned green with envy. Everyone was having fun, dancing limbo and drinking tropical cocktails. Then, the competition began, and all the girls lined up by a small catwalk. One by one, they walked in and posed while cool music played. We were told that the one with the loudest applause would win. Nora did great, but when I got on the catwalk, well, you get it, right? The beach exploded with applause. It was incredible. I had never felt so admired in my life. I became the queen of the beach and was presented with a crown made of palm leaves. I went to the bar to get a cocktail and I suddenly noticed that Blake was nowhere to be found. After going around the whole beach, I still couldn't find him. Hmm, where had he gone? Then Miley came up to me. She looked kind of upset. Lana, I wasn't sure whether to tell you or not, but come on, you've got to see this for yourself. I was confused, but I followed her, and soon we came to a hammock hanging between palm trees. It looked like Nora and Blake were in it, and they were… kissing? How was this possible? I felt so hurt. Blake pushed Nora away and got up. <sighs> I didn't even want to listen to what he had to say, and I ran away. I didn't even notice that my palm crown had fallen off my head. I walked along the beach, <laughs> crying my eyes out. I sat on a bench and realized that I really was a loser after all. What was the point of changing if Blake had just chosen another girl anyway? A man came and sat down next to me. At first, I got scared and wanted to leave, but he suddenly complimented my tattoos. These are very interesting drawings. The artist must be talented. Actually, I drew the sketches for these tattoos myself. The man looked surprised and said that if I kept practicing, I'd have a great future ahead of me. I suddenly realized that his face looked really familiar but I couldn't remember for the life of me where I'd seen him. The next day, we had a boat trip planned. We arrived at the yacht and Blake came up to me to talk. You are such a traitor. If you liked Nora, you shouldn't have been flirting with me. But I only came to the hammock because I was told you would be there. I looked at him blankly. Who told you that? It was Miley. Miley? Why had she done it? After walking around the entire deck, I found Miley at the stern of the yacht and I asked her about Blake. My friend's face twisted with anger. I had never seen her look like that. Yes, I called Blake to the hammock and I ruined your dress. Nora asked me to. Miley had conspired with Nora. A against me? I was speechless. We used to both be Blaine, but lately you've gotten so popular and I'm still a nobody. Did she really do this all out of envy? I didn't want to lose my friend, so I tried to reason with her. Look, we're still friends. I'll forget about everything you've done, and everything can be just like it used to. 
I tried to hug her, but Miley suddenly pushed me away. I tripped and I fell overboard. The waves immediately started carrying me away from the yacht, and I panicked. I was a very bad swimmer. All sorts of horror stories about sharks immediately came to my mind. Help! Hey, wait! I'm here! But no one heard me. The yacht was sailing farther and farther away, taking my chances of salvation with it. I had swallowed a lot of seawater, and tears were streaming down my face. It was the end. All of a sudden, someone grabbed my arm. I screamed, turned around, and saw Blake. <sighs> it turned out he had seen me fall and had jumped in after me. I wasn't that scared anymore. Soon, people on the yacht noticed. They dropped a life buoy and helped us get back on board. People immediately crowded around us. They wrapped me in a towel and started rubbing my arms. Miley suddenly appeared next to me and asked sarcastically, How are your tattoos after swimming in the seawater? Even after everything that she had done to me, that betrayal came as a surprise. Nora immediately grabbed my arm and rubbed my drawing away. Of course, the tattoos started to fade. When everyone realized that my tattoos weren't real, they started to make fun of me again. I hoped Blake would stand up for me, but he looked disappointed. I was amazed by how brave you were to have gotten so many tattoos, but you're just a liar. Even him kissing Nora hadn't hurt me this bad. Yeah, my tattoos were fake. So what? Was it really that important? Back at the hotel, I had hidden from everyone by the pool. To get my mind off things, I'd been reading various comics on my tablet, and I suddenly came across a photo of my favorite artist. Looking at the portrait of Dan Evans, I couldn't believe my eyes. That was the man I talked to on the embankment. That was why his face was so familiar to me. Why hadn't I recognized him right away? There was no contact information of Dan Evans publicly available, so I had no way of finding him again. I had had a one in a million chance, and I had missed it. That made me feel even worse than I had before, and I burst into tears again. As we were leaving Florida, my classmates weren't paying attention to me or making fun of me. I came home in a terrible mood. Standing in the shower, as I was angrily washing off the remnants of my tattoos, I suddenly realized I wanted to get real ones. Not because I was feeling hurt, but because I had thought about it and come to a decision, just like Henry had told me to do. The tattoos seemed to reflect my inner world and they helped me to express myself. So, the next day, instead of going to college, I went to the tattoo parlor. Henry was really happy to see me again, and he didn't try to dissuade me. So, in a few days, I had a lot of new, permanent tattoos. As I was getting the last batch of them, a visitor suddenly walked into the parlor. I turned around and I froze with my mouth open. I thought I was dreaming. It was Stan Evans. It turned out that Henry was his nephew. I almost fainted from the news. Dan Evans suddenly took a closer look at me and smiled. Oh, I remember you. You're that talented girl I saw in Florida. <sighs> I couldn't miss such an amazing opportunity again, so I asked him to take a look at some of my comics. Mr. Evans really liked them. He studied them for a long time, and then he made me a very surprising offer. As you know, my name is well known in the industry. We could write up a contract. I could become your agent and recommend you to a publishing house. If I hadn't already been sitting, I think I would have fallen over. We signed our contract the same evening. And the next day, I was on cloud nine when I returned to college. Seriously, I mean, my dream had come true. So I was over the moon. When I walked into the classroom, everyone immediately noticed my tattoos. Nora started to make fun of me. What'd you do, rob a sticker store? I was kind of expecting that reaction. So I defiantly took wet wipes out of my bag and rubbed my tattoos with them. My skin turned red and the drawing stayed clear. Well, you satisfied? My classmates were stunned, again, and I felt like a real queen, even if my crown had been left somewhere on a beach in Florida. After the lecture, Blake apologized to me and suggested that we start over. But I was already over him. I wanted to be with a person who would love me for me, and not what I had. Henry and I saw each other each and every day. I was constantly asking him about my comics, and he promised they were going to come out. One day, I went to a cafe and accidentally heard something on the TV. I usually wasn't all that interested in the news, but I heard a familiar name. For many years, the identity of Dan Evans has been shrouded in mystery. But it recently came to light that he stole many works from young, talented artists and claimed them for his own. Right now, the charlatan has already been put on the wanted list. I mechanically took a sip of my coffee without really tasting it. Still not fully realizing what I'd heard, I called Henry. 
His phone was unavailable. Then I went to the tattoo parlor, but the door was locked and the windows had been boarded up. How was this possible? I had been there just one day before! I started shaking. Could it be that I had been deceived? I couldn't believe it, so I waited for Mr. Evans or Henry to show up. But time passed and they were nowhere to be seen. One day, I went to a store and suddenly saw a familiar cover on the shelf. I had been the one to draw that. Those were my comics! My heart was pounding as I looked at the author's name and froze. It said Henry Wood. A month has passed since then. I filed a police report and even went to court. I was told that the chances of proving I was the author were very small. But I'm not gonna give up. Do you think that I can truthfully prove they're mine?